here for uh, part three of our Mike Fedorchuk shop tour and uh, thank you again for letting us crash here for a little bit and we are behind us is the uh, one of the most famous midgets in all of motorsports. We just came from the Kenyans in our last feature We got to talk to them and now we're here with Mike Fedorchuk in the original Munchkin midget. So Mike, um, tell us a little bit about this, um, how the idea came about and, and uh, what, what exactly this is. Well, the idea came about when I was on my way down to Indianapolis, or actually on my way to Louisville for a hand surgery following a crash in a super modified. I had some surgery scheduled at Louisville Hand Clinic. Uh, it was around Thanksgiving weekend, and I was going driving past the exit to the speed room, and I knew I was going to be laid up for a while with my hands being operated on, so. I decided what a good time to design a car to race at the speed room and not just win but maybe to dominate. So I start putting these ideas together in my head about lightweight and frame structure and okay what's the what's the strongest structure I know of would be like a bridge, a truss on a bridge. So if you look at this chassis from the side, it forms a this is like the roof of a house. So that's where that came from. Um, minimal amount of tubing in it. Whatever tubing is in it actually serves a good purpose, like diagonals for strength. Lightweight, as much as the rules would allow. It's 095 cage, which at the time was USAC's rule. Everything else is pretty much as light as I can get it. Uh, I incorporated a motor plate combination engine mount um, just to save the extra weight of a full coverage motor plate. It was just a little square motor plate, minimal. Everything was just downsized, as, as small as I could get. Built my own seat, pretty much a bucket <laughs> seat. Not much of a seat. Not much <laughs> of a seat. They're again lightweight, mm -hmm. it's all riveted together. Uh, Everything, I addressed everything as far as making it as light as I could. The steering arms were light, tie rods were light, sprint axles were light. I had three brakes on it instead of four wheel brakes. And my thinking there was the whole car is going to be light, so I'll need less brakes. So I just used three calipers instead of four, which consequently made it lighter. I had one shock absorber across the front. Being a lighter car, um, I figured I wouldn't need as much dampening, so I used one shock absorber. Uh, everything on it was just light. So br bring us back to the start. I know you brought some pictures out. Um, how how did you begin the process of the design work and, and actually checking it up and, and making it? Happen? Okay, so I was a draftsman by trade. Uh, my degree is in machine design, which involves a lot of drafting. And my hands, I couldn't use my fingers so much, but I could put a pencil between. Of course, this is back in the days before CAD, so I, everything was still by pencil. I drew everything quarter scale and then transferred over to my plywood fixturing. So basically I think that's probably pretty much the way guys build cars nowadays. Yet they still they build the sides half at a time, bring them together, put cross pieces in. And uh, I had all the individual components also designed at the time, like a lot of little bushings for axle parts, front axle I designed ahead of time. I had a little Volkswagen engine that I had drawn to scale. I put that in the car to get the engine placement. I had a little scale driver, <laughs> you know, representative of the average uh, male figure. He sat in the seat, so I had the steering wheel placement and everything based off that little movable guy. Everything was pretty much worked out before I even started, and then I handed off individual components to friends and family that perhaps had a machine shop that they could make some little smaller bushing and spacers for me. So it all came together and started. My hand surgery was in November. About February we started making parts. And by that summer, I've got to kick back in my memory here now, about July we had a car together. So not long at all. It wasn't too long. So one thing you keep bringing up that I think is awesome is that 
You didn't, you didn't buy any parts for this car. You, you designed and built all of it yourself. Um, so start right up there that tubing ramp. How, how big of an advantage do you think that is? Just knowing that you know every single piece on this car and how it's supposed to work and how... You know, I, I don't know if that, that part's an advantage or not. Um, to me, the part that's the advantage is knowing the mechanics of the car and, and what you know what physically takes place in a race car with roll center heights and center of gravity and the weight distribution and um, how all that works together it's kind of I think the advantage of, of building a car yourself I mean you pretty much know where all that stuff is now bring us to uh, to the first race you know the munchkin debut um, I know earlier you said it was a little bit of a gamble you didn't know if all this was gonna work out um, were you nervous at all bringing it out the first time or I was just excited to get on a racetrack, mm -hmm. actually. The first testing we had was at a high school parking lot in Fort Wayne, and from that, really couldn't tell a lot. I just was basically checking for leaks. Didn't really tell a lot about the handling there. And then the first race that we competed in was up in Morris, Illinois, at Grundy County Speedway. And at that race, the first hot lap session, I get the green and I'm driving the thing, of course, back to my younger day, and uh, I thought, I'm passing these guys, and I thought, did they see the green? You know, the green's out, guys. I mean, you can speed up now. But the car had such an advantage, and there was such a speed differential, that I thought they were under, still under the yellow. Um, <laughs> and that kind of gave me a clue as to what kind of a night it was going to be. And it, in fact, it was that kind of a night. I mean, this car just dominated that first race at Morris. So much so that the promoter invited me not to come back with that car. <laughs> and I can't find the letter that he wrote, but he wrote me a letter thanking me for coming, but invited me to leave my new creation at home. Yeah, and, so. and I know you mentioned in, in one of the earlier segments, you know, you actually got quite a few rules added to the USAC rule book um, specifically for this car. Um, so, I mean, I guess it's, it's kind of a compliment, but I mean, how, how did you feel about that? And, and, you know, how did you, did you kind of have to adjust or, or rework some things on the car after that? I, I did. Uh, personally, it was, I didn't take it as a compliment right away. The, my first reaction to it was, I was just pretty much crushed mm -hmm. because you see the size of the shop and my tow vehicle was a, a van, a 1973 Chevy van with a little trailer and I was competing against people with big big rigs, a lot of money mm -hmm. and I was just crushed with a stroke of a pen and rules that it could take away the advantage that I had worked my whole racing career towards to get to that point. Mm -hmm. I understand now, I mean I get it now that they had to do it but back then it was my whole world and I actually spent time in the chair on the floor of the shop staring and asking myself, you know, why am I doing this? What, what am I here for? What, what am I going to do now? Because that was my whole goal. Mm -hmm. And I actually had no goal in racing anymore. It's like, okay, I did this. I get, this is a, the, uh, what happens at the end of the tunnel when you get that point. So it's like, I just kind of, I didn't really give up. Mm -hmm. I did actually make some changes to the car to comply with the new rules and the car was still successful. I ended up getting a track record at IRP with the longer version of this car. Mm -hmm. The problem was it took me more money to compete then mm -hmm. and I had to have new tires on. I never did actually have a, an engine that was to the legal size. I was always one engine size smaller than what the rules allowed. Mm -hmm. Because financially, I just couldn't keep up with the, the speed that the Volkswagen engine rules were, were changing. I mean, I'd just get one engine built, in a matter of another year, they upped the cubic inch <laughs> limit again, so I was at another disadvantage. However, I was still competing and winning with that smaller engine. Mm -hmm. So, and, and the last race I ran was a, with a 151 when the engines were allowed to have 166. So, <laughs> the track record was a, with a 151. That's pretty neat. Um, um, so it, it, it just kind of took away my incentive to do any more. And at that point, I just decided to drive for other people. You know, I drove for Steve Lewis and won the 91 night before the 500. That was, I just kind of threw in a towel as far as my own car goes. Mm -hmm. More fun driving for other guys. Yeah, and um, 
obviously you, know, you guys definitely put the, the time and the work into designing the car and making it that fast and, and I mean like you said just you know at the you know flick of a pen you know it kind of brought it to a halt was there was it, there any kind of like appeals process or no, you get on the phone no, or no, I didn't, not, even, not even consider that okay. it's like that's racing man that's just that <laughs> that's the chance you take mm -hmm. and, and to this day that's the way it still is I mean mm -hmm. racing is it for sissies all right you, know, you, just, <laughs> you just suck it up and you go on and I um I see there's a couple trophies down here so obviously successful oh. right off the bat yeah um yeah the part of the uh these are probably I think they're from the speed room. Yeah, here we go. A little bit of dust. <laughs> 1990 50 lap winner. Speed room. Of course, my most famous moment on TV was when I won the um, the race on ESPN mm -hmm. with this car, and it spun out on my cool down lap. <laughs> So instead of getting the interview in the victory lane, it was like, they kind of messed that up for him. <laughs> and it actually was not intentional. I actually, the car was that, that flighty mm -hmm. that uh, I just, I lost my concentration for a quarter of a second and the thing spun around. So uh, it's, you know, it's kind of tricky to drive or it was then. It weighed, uh, what was it weighed? 796 pounds is what wow. it weighed. That's, that's crazy. That was before any, USAC rules. Now the, the weight limit I think is like 900. Wow. Almost. Let's um, let's kind of take a look back. I know you brought out some pictures here of you yeah. setting up the jig and, and actually first starting up the, yeah. uh, the construction of the munchkin. Yeah, well that just picture of it on the floor showing the A-frame with the cage added to it. And there it's on the table. I'm adding parts to it. Some of the parts I was not quite sure on the drawing board how they would go, so I went ahead and mocked everything up to make some of the final little brackets. But pretty much I had everything on, on paper before I even bent the first piece of tubing for it. And now you said you're, uh, you're actually restoring it. Yeah. So what's, what's that process look like? It's just been fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've still got the drawings, and a lot of the original parts are over on the other side of the shop. Um, but I had not worked on this thing for over a year. I just had other projects in here to work on. Um, I, I had to cut out some of the pieces of tubing that I had to add to meet the rules. And like adding the fuel tank on, the rounded fuel tank, I had some brackets on there that I ended up cutting off so I could put the original tank back on. These torsion bar arms were modified at one time, so that's not the original. There's, there's an original arm, but it got bent. <laughs> so I'll either straighten this one, or more likely I'll just start start out with another blank and make another part, get it anodized. Um, so I got a. I actually just purchased a oil cooler. I realized I didn't have an oil cooler for it, so I found an oil cooler on eBay, which I got. Um, just getting all the parts together, mm -hmm. and it, it's just been fun. It kind of takes me back. What, 30 years? Mm -hmm. These things, it was 1987, 88 that I built this car. 87, I've even got a thing on the dash oh, wow. here. Yeah. <laughs> yep, June of 87 is when that car was, so when I built it. That's definitely cool to see uh, to see it come full circle. You know, it was built right here in this, this garage and now it's, yeah. now it's being restored. and. And hopefully, like you said earlier, we can um, we can maybe make some laps at the uh, in the Coliseum again. I'd love to do it. Now, um, when you raced in the Coliseum, was that in this car when you first started out, or the first car that I raced at the Coliseum was the Ben Cook car that I bought from Jeff Knuckles. Okay. It was, a, uh, it was actually his car that I saw the first time at the Coliseum. So I ended up going back there the first time with that car, mm -hmm. and then the car that I won in there was a, a, a Rick Stewart built car that Chuck Ren Carell from Grand Rapids owned. That was in 1983. And then in 1988, I believe, I took this Munchkin and raced at the Coliseum with this Munchkin. Um, I don't really remember how I did. I didn't, it wasn't memorable. 
I did race it, I guess at Peoria, there's a thing over here on the wall that I guess I set fast time. Is it Peoria? <laughs> what was it? The Lion-Eye Grand Prix, wherever that is. <laughs> Rosemont, maybe? I don't know, some place that set fast time, but I don't know that, that this car ever did want to feature indoors. So, when you built this car, was this strictly just for pavement, or, or did yeah. you ever know that it was ever going to turn laps indoors? No, well, I, I figured it would go indoors, but never dirt. Okay. You know, guys have asked me if I've ever run on dirt. No, it wasn't really designed for that. I mean, the ground clearance is like <laughs> that much, so not really set up for dirt. Well, that's neat. It, it was mostly just short tracks and places I had a difficult time winning myself. You mm -hmm. know, I had come close at the speed room to winning in a conventional car, but I wanted to design and build something that made up for my lack of driving talent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this car did it. It made up for my lack of talent. So just just how different um, is this car from the cars that you and Tony Stewart bring in to uh, Fort Wayne every year? Pretty much the same. Right. Although, you know, they've been modified to meet the rules, mm -hmm. so they weigh a lot more. And of course they've added the, the tank on the back, um, but they're pretty much basically the same car. The That's same cool. wheelbase is the original, maybe a little bit wider. I think I built a little bit wider front axle for them. Pretty much the same car. And I'm I'm hesitant to bring this up, but I mean the Munchkin has been winning races, you know, longer than I've been alive. Which cool. <laughs> which which isn't as much of a dig on you as it is like an ode to just how successful these cars are. Like did you ever imagine this car being that successful? No, not yeah. ever. No. And, and and there's nothing unconventional about it. I mean it's basically nineteen sixties technology mm -hmm. with anti roll bars. You did an interview with Tony and he was bragging about the car, um, <laughs> but it was just a good design basically, and he can tell you that it's easy to work with mm -hmm. and responds to changes, and that's basically all it takes. I mean, rocket science, it's not. Mm -hmm. It's just basic stuff, and this car was built with basic, simple principles involved, and it still applies today, and it's still successful, I think, just because of that. And a lot of it has to do with him. You know, this car's success I owe to him in the mm -hmm. modern day era. So without him revitalizing it and bringing it back, it would I would just be another number, you know, basically. Yeah. So thank you to Tony Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, um, you know, we mentioned there's definitely been some rules put in place. Uh, thanks to you. Is there any, is there any like advancements in the technology of the car or any of the engineering that's, you know, like you said, still applies today from this car? From I didn't just quite um, just anything from this car that that they picked up because of you know you designing this car like you said I know you switched to three brakes you made it a lot okay. lighter all right yeah well the biggest thing I can see nowadays is the uh, the the U-shaped rear panhard rod mm -hmm. which Chuck Rencrell and I experimented with back in 1981 up to that point there nothing existed like that. People were still using a short little panard on the left side mounted over the left bird cage. And that affected the way the roll center reacted on, on the chassis roll. And I had read some books and wanted to experiment with making the roll center lower. And the way to do that was to mount it on the right side of the chassis because it goes down in the corner. So what better way to get there than the, the rear end was in the way. So we had to go underneath the rear end to go over to attach that point. And it's everyday technology now, but back in 1981, nobody was doing that. Mm -hmm. I did it. Chuck Rencarell and I, I made one for his car. We took it to a parking lot up in Grand Rapids and got a stopwatch on just a little uh, friction circle we made, and it definitely made an improvement, so we started using it from that point on. And on pavement, it turned out to be, to make the car a lot more drivable. Mm -hmm. And to this day, it still holds true. I mean, you'll see any car down at the low 500 that's going fast and it's got that W or U-shaped rear panhard on. And, and that's, that, that came from 1981. And as far as I know, I'm the first one that used that. And that's that's crazy to think, like like you said, you know, no one ever like thought of that or started using it. And um, is that kind of thanks to like your engineering background or your schooling and, and fabrication or? I I just think it's because there's certain people that can just see things mm -hmm. and I could see in my mind 
I could visualize this roll center and what it had to do and how we had to get there. And like I said, the rear end was in the way, but you have to think outside of obstructions mm -hmm. in anything you do with the car. And that's that's some place like, you know, I have a lot of admiration for, for Danny Drynan or Bob East. They have that ability to do that also. Mm -hmm. They can see, see what needs to be done and figure out a way to get there. Um, so that's just what I did. It's not, it's not any kind of rocket science, it's just, it's not letting conventional thinking stop you. Mm -hmm. you know, and I did the same thing when I designed this welding pedal, remote welding pedal. Mm -hmm. I had a job in here where I was moving things around, going from one end of my fixture to the other, and the welding pedal cable kept getting in the way. <laughs> it's in here, you know, like it's on the ground. Every time I trip over. Yeah. So I'm thinking, I need to get rid of this because it's really cutting into my time. <laughs> so at the time I was flying model airplanes and I thought, well, why not put a servo to take the place of doing you know, this with your foot, put a servo in there that does that. Mm -hmm. So what I did was, I'll show this part of the tour. <laughs> I made a unit that plugs into the welder. This plugs in and takes the place of that pedal. This is the transmitter, like you would have in your airplane. That's just a regular stick off of a radio control airplane transmitter. So when you press the pedal down, it operates a stick on the transmitter, sends a signal to this. The servo in this operates the mechanism that's in here and controls your amperage on your welder. And I got a patent on it <laughs> back in 1999. Wow. And like I said before, I presented that to Miller Electric and they didn't do anything with it right away, but then seven years later, when it came time to renew the patent is when they came out with theirs. <laughs> so they have Excuse me, Miller, but <laughs> Here's their pedal. Pretty, pretty similar. <laughs> yeah, pretty similar. Doesn't have a cord on it to get tangled up. Mm -hmm. I'm. This is one of those things where it's a compliment. I was hoping to get some financial gain from it by selling the idea to them. Mm -hmm. They ended up giving me nothing, mm -hmm. but it's a very big compliment. To, yeah. To have them actually think it was a good idea. So I had goals. My goal was to make a successful race car to, uh, I'd rate my racing goals were to have a successful nationally known chassis, like Don Edmonds, he's my hero. Uh, another thing was to get invited to race in New Zealand, like Sleepy Trip, another one of my heroes. And uh, the third thing was just to, you know, make it, make it in racing, make a good race car. And I, I think you've done a pretty good job of, uh, of checking all those <laughs> off. Um, well, then after after this car was kind of, uh, you know, the advantage was taken away, I sat here for a couple of days with no goals. Yeah. So the, this pedal was like another kind of a semi-goal. It's like, okay, I'll develop this and make something out of it. But, of course, never, nothing ever came of it. But. Well, it's, it's cool to kind of get to uh, dive into the, the mind of Mike Fedorchek here uh, and kind of learn more about the, uh, the munchkin and, and just the shop in general. It's cool, the history that came out of it. Um, when, uh, like you said, you know, you didn't know how successful it was going to be, but like what, what did that feel like when you first got on the track? And like you said, you were passing people and you were, I mean, you, you beat quite a few big names, probably some heroes out there. Um, yeah. What was that like? Um. Maybe I'm humble, <laughs> but it wasn't that big of a deal. Really? Yeah, it was more about just being excited that my idea worked. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, pr I'm more proud now than I ever was back then. Mm -hmm. You know, it's more, it's more beneficial to me now to have that now than it was back then. Mm -hmm. Back then, I, it was about making money back then. You know, I wanted to make money at it, and that was this car was a way for me to do that. And then when ESPN came along, there's another opportunity. So 
And ESPN was great for getting some notoriety and getting my name known. It actually got me invited to race in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. So uh, that that goes. And, and Stan Fox is responsible for that, basically, just the connection I had with him. Mm -hmm. You know, he was a regular down there, and uh, my friendship with him is what pretty much got me invited to race there. So it all just somehow works out. Yeah. You know, if you keep your mind. <laughs> if you keep in the back of your mind what you want to accomplish, then it happens. Well, um, again, we really appreciate you letting uh, letting us kind of hang out here for the day and, and really take a look at the first Munchkin. Uh, I know I'm really excited to, to see the progress on the restoration and, and hopefully see that back inside the Coliseum at some point. Um, you and me both, man. <laughs> yeah, that, that'll be very uh, a very, very special moment for sure. Um, so thanks again for letting us kind of take the shop tour, um, giving us a little bit of a look inside the bunchkin, a little bit of a look inside Mike Fedorchuk's head, which is uh, definitely always interesting. Um, and and stay tuned because we'll be uh, we'll be doing some more Rumble features like this, and uh, I'm excited. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Mike.